or a significant other if that person is married or has a fiance or a girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, it's knowing that what they're going through emotionally, but what wheels have been set in motion as a result of the crash. Um, the family that I spoke about earlier, the soldier, okay. you know, they're looking at having to sell their home because their current home is not one that can be um, changed to make it handicap accessible the way in which he needs it in terms of the doorways being um, wide enough for his wheelchair or adding the ramp. Um, they spoke about um, their hospital bills. His sister spoke about her children and how this was their uncle that used to roughhouse and run around with them, but yet now they're, they're not scared of him, but they're shy now because they see him with no legs. They see him with the prosthetics now. So she said I, they have to learn how to love him again in a new way. So just, you know, meeting the families and understanding the emotional roller coaster that they go through. And again, the wheels that are set in motion by what happens, um, I'm truly humbled um, and inspired. Um, I know off camera we talked about, you know, how do, how do I handle Correct. it? I do, I have to uh, spend time with family like you mentioned earlier um, to take my mind off of those things, but I remind myself the nervousness, the anxiety that I'm feeling, the emotions that I have going on right now is nothing compared to the emotions that they have been experiencing, but they will continue to experience through their journey following the crash. Does MAD offer like counseling services or anything to help these family members to deal with that situation? We do. We have a we have a volunteer advocate program, and we do have a um, staff victim services specialist as well. But our victim services program is free of charge to uh, families impacted by um, impaired driving. We provide emotional support. We provide um, guidance um, through the criminal justice system. We help them apply for victim assistance funding through um, the state. And we also help them in terms of community referrals. So if they have financial need or if they have professional counseling needs, then we have individuals, companies, not companies, but entities that we work with in the community to make those referrals. And those are all free of charge. Um, last year we served um, 296 victims. And for us, that was almost a 10% increase over the number of victims we served last year. While we're proud to be able to have that increase in the number of victims served, we're also saddened too because it's continuing to happen and it's more stories. So our goal is to serve each victim survivor until we finally get to the point to where, uh, where people are making those, the healthy decisions and having that non-drinking designated driver. As far as the punishment that you have seen for drunk drivers, Mm -hmm. What would you consider, do you consider it being footing the crime that was committed, in your opinion? You know, it's tough to answer that. Uh, of course, I can give the little Rhonda answer. I could give the, the victim family answer. I could give the mad answer. And the reason why I say that is because whatever punishment a person does get, does it fit the fact that they're serving X number of jails in years, but this family member is gone? Or does the fact that they're spending X number of months in jail um, fit the fact that this person is dealing with a brain injury and they were a successful business person but now they have the IQ of a 10 year old? Um, do I feel like some of our laws could change to um, keep us safe um, and be improved upon? Yes, and that's some work that we're doing through um, grassroots lobbying and we'll be kicking that up again in May. Um, but I don't think there's going to be any level of punishment that's going to really fit the, um, the consequences of their act. But will it help? I mean, because if they're not getting a lot of time for, mm -hmm. what's the difference between me killing someone in a vehicle and me killing someone with a gun? Oh, well, there's no difference. 
There is no difference because while the gun was that person's weapon in one case, in an impaired driving um, crash, it was the car that was that person's weapon. So there is no difference. Um, so I think an individual should be punished. Um, I think it should be uh, consistent and I think it needs to be swift because it's, it's increasing awareness and it's sending a message to individuals that this is something that has to stop. But it's also something for that individual that is being punished to where you know it prevents them from re-offending. Uh, re um, I say it needs to be swift because right now due to lack of resources, we have an issue to where cases are being um, postponed, well, continued, that's the word. They're being continued a number of times. And a person during that time waiting on one DWI case to be tried and hopefully convicted, he or she has an opportunity to reoffend while they're waiting. And we've had cases like that happen. In the western part of the state, we had a young woman who we were waiting on um, her blood draw to come back from the state lab so that her case for one offense could be tried. However, because, again, lack of resources, the need to increase, um, reduce the turnaround time in that blood work coming from our labs, she was back on the road, driving impaired, hit a woman, a single mother. That could have been avoided if the resources were in place to have had that blood available when it was time for her to go to court to where she could have been convicted of that DWI. So she would not have been on the road. The other thing that Matt is working on is an ignition interlock bill to where a first time um, convicted, first time offender will be required to have an ignition interlock on his or her car. We say first time offender because we know that's the first time that this person has been convicted. Research shows, the CDC shows conservatively that a person drives 80 to 88 times before they are ever caught. So we know that the first offender is just as dangerous as the habitual offender because they've done it before. This is just their first conviction. But with putting the ignition interlock on their car, we're allowing them to continue to be the breadwinner. We're allowing them to continue pursuing an education, you know, whatever they need to do in their daily lives. However, we're taking away the ability for them to operate a car while impaired. We're using technology to save lives. Will it um, cure the problem 100%? No. Will there be individuals who try to find a way to get around it? Of course. But do we not make, take that step? to save lives just because there is a small percentage of people that are going to try to get around it? I don't think so. I know you said ignition lock. Mm -hmm. For our viewing audience that may not be aware of that, what is that ignition lock? It's a device that is placed on your car um, that does not allow your car to crank without you pr uh, first proving that you're not impaired. So it's a device that you put in and you have to blow in it. and they. It's not just a blow, but it's like a, a blow, hum, and suck to where it's calibrated to each individual to prevent you from having someone else getting in the car and doing it for you. And um, when you get in the car, you have to blow. Um, NHTSA's standard is to have that at a .025, um, but it is calibrated and set based on a person's probation or um, or really, you can have it voluntarily, so whatever you want it set. But NHTSA's standard is 0 .025. If I blow in there, there's no alcohol in my system, I can crank my car and go about my business. Now, I will say it does require you to blow a second time within a certain amount of time because you may have had someone who had a friend or a family member blow in it to get their car started. However, Two things, as you're going down the road, is that person still going to be with you? But two, you may not have, your BAC may not have been one to where it registered, but if you have been drinking, as time passes, that number is going to um, increase. So you blow in it again, then it may show that you're impaired and you shouldn't be driving. Now, some people say, well, that's dangerous. Your car just stops, you know, while you're driving down the road. No. Um, because again, that would be dangerous. 
but what it does do is causes your um, lights on your car to start flashing, oh, okay. your horn starts blowing, so it alerts people something's going on with this individual. And we're working to train our law enforcement officers to recognize that so they know to pull these individuals over to find out what is going on. And when they get there and see that that ignition interlock is in the car, then they realize it's a violation because either they did not blow within the allotted well, the required amount of time, or they blew and they, um, their BAC is above the standard. What are some of the other events that Mothers Against Drunk Drivers are having in the state of North Carolina? Well, um, for Charlotte, we've got our Walt Light Mad event coming up. Um, and I, I have to put that out there because it's so important. Right. Um, North Carolina, the way in which MAD is set up, you know, um, it's exciting to be able to tell individuals that every dollar that we raise in North Carolina stays in North Carolina to where we don't give a percentage to our national office. We raise funds to save lives here in North Carolina. But with that being said, we don't get funding from our national office either. Now, while we get resources, which I'm truly grateful for because it does not affect my budget locally, um, we need to make sure we're raising funds to sustain our mission so we can continue to provide the power parents that I mentioned free so that we can continue to support our victims free of charge. And that comes through the success of our fundraising events. And what like mad is coming up on Saturday, October 26th at Freedom Park. Oh, 25th, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, at Freedom Park. And it's a family fun event. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have the face painting, music, free food, um, games, you know, different activities. And it's a celebration of life to where we have families that come and um, we have a family that shares their story. Um, because they're using their voice, but it's also a celebration of life because we want to bring everyone, men and women, um, as well as individuals that have no stories. If someone wanted to get in contact with you, how would they do that, Ms. Scott? 919-787-6599 or visit us at mad.org. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Ms. LaRonda Scott for being on the show. You be encouraged. Thank you.